listening to the Ocean Rowing Podcast. I'm your host, Amanda Painter, physical therapist and owner of Strong and Empowered Rowing. I help people continue their love of rowing without aches and pains. Along the way, I decided I wanted to row across the Atlantic Ocean. I'm finding it super hard to get in touch with previous ocean rowers and find the answers on how to make this possible. So this podcast is to share my story and what I learn as I get ready for and ultimately cross the Atlantic Ocean. Hear from experts in different areas and from others who have completed ocean rows. So anyone who wants to do this has easy access and we can share our stories with the world. And it was a joyful experience most of the time with my mum. And she was awesome. She was freaking awesome. Um, and we really didn't have any problems on that, very, um, on that trip, except the fact that it took so long. <laughs> and it was mind-numbingly boring. Oh my God, it was so boring. Boring, Jesus, boring. <laughs> I don't think anybody really prepares you for how boring it is. Oh my God, it's so boring, boring. I'm curious what games you played. No one's mentioned Oh, that. yeah. Oh. So just things like, oh God, it's so, if you had a shop, what would you sell and what would you call it? <laughs> so okay. oh, that's really interesting. Right. So my, my shop, I had two shops. I had two shops. All right, that was Sally Kettle and you guessed it, she is the guest of this episode. Uh, it was bright and early for me, seven-ish in the morning uh, and I was barely awake but I had such a blast talking with Sally bright and early. Uh, we learn about both of her trips where she went east to west across the Atlantic once with her mother. Uh, we talk about shark attacks. Uh, there were some hurricanes that happened uh, and just lots of amazing things that she has to share. Everything from uh, what the most important thing to have uh, while you're crossing an ocean is, um, and it's probably not something you're thinking of because it is not a tangible object. Um, so definitely listen to find that out. Uh, also, she's the first person to mention some of the games she played. So we talk a little bit about that, which you just heard a snippet of. So listen for those answers. Of course, I asked my favorite question about some foods uh, and lots of other great information. If you are a female who wants to be an ocean rower or who is an ocean rower, you should definitely listen to this episode. Uh, I was uh, amazingly energized when I left this conversation and I really hope to chat with her again. I just ordered her book, her book, so I'm really excited to read that as well. Um, and yeah, enjoy this podcast. All right. Okay. So, um, I'm Sally. I uh, rode the first time, I, well, I've done three attempts and been successful twice. So the first time was 2003 um, into 2004, first successful one, and the second one was 2005 into 2006. The first one I was going to go with a boyfriend, but he had an epileptic seizure um, four days in, and we ended up having to come back. And then I asked my mum to come with me. She had two months to train. She got in the boat. We went out um, and it took us four months. And then we got a world record for being the first mother and daughter to row the ocean, which is kind of cool. And the second time I went with three other girls. Uh, we were in a team um, called Row Girls and we wanted to get a world record, which so many people really want <laughs> when they do ocean rowing because they're so achievable, weirdly achievable. And... Um, we were out for seven to seven days. We started as a four, ended as a three, disqualified from the race, and the worst weather in the Atlantic for nearly 200 years. Lost our rudder, broke our water maker, the hatches were damaged, loads, lost loads of food, uh, attacked by a shark. Um, you know, just everything that could go wrong went, went, <laughs> went wrong. Wow. Uh, I know, that's crazy shit, right? Yeah, it's um, pretty crazy. And... Um, yeah, it was a complete unmitigated blood disaster. But, you know, we made it across the line. And um, my lovely teammate who got off the boat, um, she'd hurt herself. Um, she'd fallen and she just didn't, she just didn't want to be there anymore. And um, that's quite a, a really tough situation to have to deal with for her and for us. Um, but she ended up going again. And she went in a, uh, a team called Unfinished Business with other women who'd also 
um, had problems getting across in the same race and they got the world record for the fastest women's ball. Wow. Um, That's an awesome name, Unfinished Business for all people. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I know that. And you know what? Also, though, when they finished, they, they took off the un bit and now they're called Finished Business, which is kind of cool, right? I'm really super proud of her. And, That's and awesome. That too. Yeah, it was awesome. So when I started out, only, I think, um, 15 women had ever attempted any um, row in the world ever. And at that time, um, when I entered the first race, it was with Shea Blythe and Challenge Business. So that was a long time ago. I feel like I was, you know, you know when, when um, people who go to Mount Everest or go to uh, the North Pole and they're, they're in kind of woolly jumpers and leather shoes. <laughs> That's what it felt like for us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, you know, it, we, the technology was, we didn't have, I, you know what, we still had only text in mobile phones. <laughs> so you couldn't really even take a photo. And if you wanted to do video, you had to take a camera, a camcorder, that you literally sat on your shoulder. <laughs> so we sort of thought, maybe not, that takes up too much time, um, space, so we didn't do that. But yeah, I was going to go with Tomo, who was my boyfriend at the time. We'd never rode before. We'd never been at sea. But it seemed so ultimately achievable. And um, um, we were totally in it for the adventure. And, you know, we had no kind of passions for getting across in the fastest time. We thought we'd probably be last. We wanted to raise a lot of money for the Fund for Epilepsy, which was a charity we chose that year. And um, in the end, we did. We raised um, £268,000, which is a huge amount of money, which is nearly, what, um, uh, half a million dollars, I think. It's about that, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So it's a lot. And, um, yeah, so, but he didn't end up going. And I ended up taking my mum, who I hadn't really spoken to for 10 years before that. Wow. And um, we rode together, and it took us so long. Oh, my God, it took us so long. <laughs> <laughs> four months at sea is a long time um but you know what in in its own way that was its own achievement the fact that we had stayed there for so long and survived it um you know four months at sea is a long time at sea with only one other person in your company mm -hmm. so <clears throat> and she was amazing and she taught me the value of kindness and if i could give you know one overriding tip on this on, to any team that goes for whatever reason is that um, kindness makes all the difference on the boat and um, there'll be times when you do not feel like you want to be kind to anybody <laughs> um, but it should be absolutely forefront of your mind because it's a very small boat in a very big ocean and you are sat within you know inches of that other person or other people for a very long time and if you can't be kind to them um, and they can't be kind to you, it makes for a really, really uncomfortable situation. And the one thing that I definitely learned from going with my mum is that for me at that time, and for many people who do do it, this is probably going to be a, a once in a lifetime experience. And um, there's, the, and you've got to make the most of it. Um, and that's something we definitely noticed between the teams very much in the, in the first experience with Tomo and the second um, row we went on um, that year. And it hasn't happened before and it hasn't happened since. They had two um, trips going within months of each other. So the first time it was with um, Challenge Business. Um, the second time it was with the Ocean Rowing Society. So they'd organised a regatta. And the difference in the atmosphere was palpable because um, with Challenge Business, people were really talking to each other. There was, you know, it was, it was nice, but it was, it was very competitive. We really wanted it to, to be an opportunity to win the race, to get the prize. And in the Ocean Rowing Regatta, everybody was there to support each other. People came around from other crews to check over the boat and to kind of give ideas and to you know um, wish you luck and um it was there was a real sense of camaraderie um i i'm not sure i haven't been to the start of a talisker um race yet and, I, and it'd be interesting to see how that feels as well i suspect that it's kind of like a happy medium now because these things have been going for a long time but there was a distinct difference between the two when i was doing it um so uh yeah we just wanted to go for the adventure and when 
Wales came to see us and and um, um, birds sat on our head and, and sat on the boat. We embraced those experiences because we knew that, that we were going to be slow and that took the pressure off from having to race it. And it was a joyful experience most of the time with my mum. And she was awesome. She was freaking awesome. Um, and we really didn't have any problems on that, right, um, on that trip, except the fact that it took so long. <laughs> and it was mind-numbingly boring. Oh, my God, it was so boring. Boring. Jesus, boring. <laughs> I don't think anybody really prepares you for how boring it is. Oh, my God, it's a so boring, boring. <laughs> really, it's, Yeah, it's boring. Um, and I'm sorry, and is you, it boring? <laughs> then, you know what? It's funny you should ask me that because you know, maybe I haven't told you enough, but it totally is boring. <laughs> and um, you, you, you have to tackle the boredom, um, you know, hardcore in a hardcore way. You've just that's what you've got to do is really hit it hard on the, the games you can play and the things that you can talk about. <laughs> but actually, most of the time, you end up just sitting in silence. Um, and um, that's that's fascinating in its own way um, because you you think you're going to think about well I thought I was going to go out there and think about the meaning of life you know and all these deep and interesting and inspiring things and come back a changed person <laughs> because I've had this opportunity to gaze at my navel for 106 <laughs> days but actually you spend most of the time trying to remember one goddamn song <laughs> and you can't get past the lyric in your head so you go la 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 <laughs> you know, why can't i have more intellectual thought <laughs> it's really frustrating yeah yeah and um yeah it was uh, a an extraordinary time and and one that seems to pass incredibly quickly, but very slowly whilst you're out there. So, like I said, with Mum and I taking so long, once we got to land, uh, we, we came into Barbados, um, we'd been expecting to be there for so long that actually when we got there, it was a bit of an anticlimax. It was a massive anticlimax, you know, because we'd already imagined it so many times in our own heads. And also there was a sense of it being over. And also the sense that we'd had such a, it's been such a privileged time because you have nothing complex to worry about. Everything is very simple. You know, what are you going to choose to eat that day? Is the water maker broken? Let's find the instructions and let's fix it. Is there somebody coming? Over? Is there a tanker coming? You know, you're, you're, you are, you are not fogged by, the mortgage, work, politics at work, you know, should you be having kids? How do I pay for the electricity? All those kind of weird and wonderful things that kind of go on in your everyday life. I need to clean the house. Da, 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 da. Everything is simple. And then when you get to the end, there's a, I found it, found it actually weirdly gut-wrenchingly anxiety making, the fact that I had to leave this simple lifestyle to go back to the complexity of the real world. And um, it felt when we got home that my snail shell was in very, very heavy. All the stuff that I owned, all the things that I had to do felt very burdensome. And I didn't expect that. Um, I, I hadn't appreciated how liberating it is to live on your wits where you're you literally have one wet wipe to make last for one day <laughs> so you're using a corner corner in the morning a corner in the afternoon <laughs> and the rest for the whole body wash at the end of the day <laughs> oh by the way on wet wipes don't get perfume wet wipes oh my god that'll make you want to heave don't get what kind perfumed so oh. nothing with any great smells everything smells so much richer when it's out there so Anything that's perfumed, creams and wipes and stuff, keep that really low par um, because the air is so fresh and your senses are so heightened that actually those sort of smells can be quite over, overwhelming. Um, 
and yeah, so when Mum and I came into Barbados, it was quite late at night, so we weren't allowed to get off until the next morning. Um, we'd wished, I'd felt that I'd wished every day away on that trip. Every day, I didn't want to be there. Every day I wanted it to end, but I never wanted to fail. Um, I didn't want it to finish in terms of me stopping. I just wanted it to, oh God. But then as soon as we got there, it had gone in a flash. Mm. And an absolute flash. And it'd be interesting to speak to those crews who went very quickly, you know, the sort of like the sub 40 days as, because they probably felt that it lasted a long time, but how did they feel in terms of now with perspective, did it feel like it had gone very quickly? Um, because I certainly felt that it had. And I made a promise not to wish my time away after that. Um, and so for the second trip, it was really, really interesting because I had a lot of ghosts that I wanted to put to bed. There was, you know, I'd taken a long time on the first one. I wanted a world record for the second one. I wanted, oh, I'm beeping. <laughs> um, uh, I wanted a, a world record for the second one. You know, I wanted to be a big fish in a big pond and um, skipper the first women's fall. So it was everything to play for. Um, but actually, what you can't mitigate against is the weather. And you know, you can be as prepared as you want to be um, and set expectations of how well you're going to do, but you go out there into the open ocean and it will throw everything at you. And that's exactly what it did. And um, it was, it at times felt like a fight for survival in that race. Um, and um, it was interesting at that time because there weren't very many women who'd done it or wanted to do it. And certainly when I was pulling my team together, there was a temptation just to say yes to the first person who said they'd go. And I think lots of crews will find that when they're pulling their team together. Well, so and so said yes, and we desperately need a fourth person. Let's put them in the crew. Um, and, you know, that has its benefits, but it also has its drawbacks. Um, in that you, they may not have the same goal as you. So um, I went, definitely went with a view to winning the race. And the other girls went with a view to just making it across the Atlantic Ocean. And um, when you have two very different um, mindsets and goals, they can create a huge amount of conflict when it comes to actually making decisions that enable you to do one or the other of those two goals. Um, so, you know, aligning your goals with the crew that you're going with is in, in so many ways more important than the enthusiasm of the person who's coming with you. Um, so I'd highly recommend you spend some time doing that. Um, and in terms of fundraising, crikey O'Reilly, you know, there's a, <laughs> we did it twice. Oh my God, I can't believe I, I actually raised all the money. It was unbelievable. And actually most of the stuff is given in kind. Um, and that's something to really think about is that most of the time you won't need the cash. The cash pays for the flights, the insurance, probably the boat, but everything else could be gathered in kind. So jackets and life jackets and medical kit and the like. So, you know, really consider you know, what's the minimum amount of actual cash you need and then try and get the rest as donations. Um, it's a good way to go. And I think there's a real simple equation to it really, and that is in, if you have the time, then you can start developing the relationships you need to gain the sponsors. And it is a relationship. Um, it's very, very rare that you're gonna get a cold call that's gonna come good. If you don't have the time, then you're going to have to spend the money. So I know quite a few crews who just didn't have that time. They were working full-time jobs. They didn't have the, the energy, the resources to actually write those letters, develop those relationships. So they just remortgaged the house and paid for it. So the equation is if you have the time, spend the time. And if you don't have this time, spend your own money. Um, but I always said about both those expeditions is that it's... Um, it's not a hobby, it's a business. Because the, when, when you have a, have a hobby mindset, what you end up doing is jeopardizing your own financial security to achieve your goal. And I've seen it 
so often where people have gone with an expectation of the world record of the fastest time and they sunk their remortgage money into it and they've given up their job and they've spent thousands of pounds. I mean, literally hundreds of thousands of pounds spent. And then they go out into the open ocean. It throws everything at them. They leap in second from last and they're wondering what the hell have I done? You know, they could have jeopardized their family home for this, you know, this experience. Um, and I would absolutely guard against that. If you go in with a business mindset, it's slightly different because you're not putting your family's finances on the line. Yep. So um, that's what we did on the second one, very much so, is that we were 100% keen to make sure that the rowers weren't um, screwed at the end. Um, so we put in the time and the energy um, needed to actually bring in the money necessary to do it, as well as raise 30 grand for Shelterbox on top of that so we all came out of it we didn't make money out of it um but none of us lost money um and it's a win uh, it's a win that's a massive win that is a huge win yeah if you can just come out evens you're you're doing well right um but you have to go in with that mindset from the, from the get-go absolutely from the get-go because then you it will drive you to push harder to make the contacts and relationships you need to be able to to get it off the ground on the first one, I lost my, my flat. And the reason for that was because um, there was a guy living in it and, and supposed to be paying the rent and he didn't, and he defaulted, I defaulted on the mortgage. And this stuff happens all the time. And I just didn't have the savings to be able to, you know, bail myself out and I ended up having to sign on um, in the UK. And that was pretty hardcore. And you can imagine having had this incredible experience with your mum, bonding relationship, you know, and it was extraordinary. And so many people heard about it. We had our fair share of PR and then you come back and you've lost your flat. You're living with your parents and you're signing on. Yep. Yeah, it's crap. It's pretty crap. Um, and that's probably, you know, one of the reasons why it drove me to be so hardline on the second trip understandable yeah 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 and and also it's very interesting when you um you you have you, i think you have kind of like almost two groups of people and they're they're the ones who want it to change their lives and the ones who want it just to be an experience within their life and i wanted it to change my life and it did and i'd say for the other girls a couple of the other girls they just wanted to be part of an experience. The same with my mum as well. You know, just part of an experience that they can say they did. For me, it was totally different. I wanted it to completely flatten anything that had gone before and create a new space in which I could just run into. And that's exactly what it did. And I um, ended up going off and being a professional adventurer for 15 years afterwards. Um, wrote a book, did the inspirational speaking, loved it, so excited. And that's actually really fascinating and exciting to see so many women rising up through the ocean rowing ranks as well and, um, and seeing them taking part because, you know, there'd, there'd only been, there was only me and my mum in the first race <laughs> and there was only me and one other woman in the second, in, uh, sorry, me and my mum in the first race when I went with Tomo, there was only me and this other, another woman called Faye who was, was taking part, you know, um, it's so great to see parity. I don't know whether telescopes and implemented this by at one point I was having a bit of a, a bra burning session where I was thinking you know there needs to be a line on this prize for the for the women's teams mm. do you know if there is a line on this prize for the women's teams uh, I'm not aware I yeah know. yeah because at the time you know there weren't so no women's team would ever get line on us yeah. because they couldn't possibly right physically it's almost impossible for a women's team to beat the men's teams right and I think that's inherently unfair if you're going in as a competitive female team, you should be able to compete against other competitive female teams and there should be a prize for that. Um, I don't know if that's been done. I'd like to think it has been, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I know they talk about the winner of the challenge, but yeah. I haven't seen it broken down or any change. Oh, exactly. No. Exactly that, right? So the winner of the challenge is the Lion Prize, right? The Lion Prize. Who's going to be that Lion Prize? team right and they're you know that's that's fabulous 
for the men's teams and that's kind of a bit shit for the women's teams you know there should be the winner of the women's um so um and i'd like to see that change especially as it's professionalizing yep. massively professionalizing i think uh, i think the team have done an amazing job at um you know making the race safer with more people taking part with more opportunities for people to take part from all around the world you know it really has brought the sport up and i'm, I'm super excited about that yeah it's a very great and valid point though like i yeah. haven't seen that differentiation yeah because otherwise you're just going and thinking oh you know oh i really want to be competitive but you're never fucking gonna win anything and then the, you know you, it might be a big slap on the back at the end by the other girls teams but you know what does that mean yeah yeah and instead it's yeah. mostly about the let me be the first trio of females or and yeah that it's more specialized for that completion as opposed to yeah. A completion all out yeah yeah exactly that yeah exactly that um and i think that's inherent unfair agreed yeah i mean there may be feminists out there and i i you know i can totally see their view and that is you know they should be able to play on a level playing field with the men and actually you know there should be an opportunity but then um you know, there are there are sports in which you can do that but the physicality of this sport i think um um, undermines women women's ability to win to win it yep. so anyway soapbox rant over <laughs> this is amazing you have touched on so many things that nobody has touched on which is why i love doing this oh wow what like what <laughs> so one i love the kindness like that that should be what you go into this thinking like you need to be genuine and kind to each other and everybody on that boat no one has brought that perspective uh, other people have said boring, but I love how you said it. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, let's see. Uh, I'm curious what games you played. No one's mentioned. Oh, yeah. Oh, so just things like, oh God, just say, if you had a shop, what would you sell and what would you call it? <laughs> so okay. oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, right. So my, my shop, I had two shops. I had two shops. Mine was um, the pharmacy, which was a greengrocer's farm, spelt F A R M, farm, I see. Oh my God, see the things happening there. Yeah, man. <laughs> They're probably organic, it's organic food. <laughs> right, That's so that mind great. blowing when you're in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> yeah, in the middle of the ocean, this is like, what? Why hasn't this happened already? <laughs> and the other one, which made me laugh heartily, was. Plump. <laughs> I wanted a children's um, children's clothes shop called Plump <laughs> because I just love the word. And you know, when you're out there, things get really silly, and you're just laughing mm -hmm. your head off thinking this is the funniest thing I've ever said in my entire life. <laughs> Everybody else is going right. <laughs> okay, this is really freaking hysterical. Uh, so you have your own business, is that correct? I well, yeah, I do. I um, so. There's two things I'm doing right now. So I've been a, uh, an inspirational speaker and adventure, like I said, for 10, 15 years. So that's been going a while. And actually, um, there's, a, there's a few women on the inspirational speaking rounds. Um, we rarely get to see each other. And uh, it's, that has changed massively as well, in that when I started out, I usually was the very first female speaker that these companies ever had. You know, they just never had speakers, female speakers. Um, and now, you know, there's m way more women on the circuit, which is really, really cool to see. They're the competition, but <laughs> I still want to stab them. But that, no, it's really great. <laughs> yeah, so that's really great. Um, but I'm sort of segueing out of that now and um, going into uh, charity work. So I've always done stuff for charity, which is really exciting. And um, I've had, uh, I had a child about three years ago, so she's, um, she's three now. And um, I'm starting a, thank you, starting a charity called the Active Pregnancy Foundation, because you'll find if, you know, if anybody's um, thinking about getting pregnant, that nobody gives you any advice on how to stay active. And, you know, so many people get into Ocean, into Ocean Road specifically are active people. Mm -hmm. uh, they're active adventurous people and women are massively discriminated against when it comes to their pregnancies. Yep. There is hardly any provision for um, women that you, um, that, unless you pay for it, um, and there's barely any consistent advice. 
and there's hardly any training and expertise given to personal trainers and, and people within the health and fitness industry to enable you to do what you want to do. And I lost myself in that. You know, for somebody who was very active, very get out and go, and then to be faced with, you know, a pregnancy which was quite awkward and difficult, had IVF, which was really distressing at the time, you know, I really wanted to be active and it was, it was difficult to, to keep that going. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, we, we've got to change culture around that. It, it seems like so stupid. <laughs> it's very true. So I'm, in a, I'm a physical therapist and I'm in a group of physical therapy entrepreneurs. Uh, and there are a lot of people saying exactly what you are saying uh, yeah. in that regards and just trying to raise awareness to you can think it used to be you don't do any activity like yes. you're stuck and it really is changing and the research is changing and people doing it. Uh, and it, it's definitely something that people need to be aware of. Yeah, and what we're, we're the first charity that's actually doing it. So we're doing it, man. We're totally doing it. We're gonna, we're gonna do this. <laughs> that is amazing. So yeah, you, it's, it's, it's not relevant. Really, sorry, second. Did you decide to be an adventurer when you were on the water? Um, no, no, no. you know what I? You, no, well, yes and no. What I, but what I, or you, this, this won't resonate with you because you've probably never heard of it but there's a children's program called um blue peter in the uk right and it's a it's it's a program that anybody my age and, and probably just a few years younger will know about and on blue peter they have young presenters who do exciting adventurous things that's what i wanted to be there we <laughs> go be a blue peter presenter. <laughs> it's so sad it's so sad but true right so i kind of thought this is going to be amazing. I'm going to go through this incredible journey with my mum and I'm going to come away and TV companies are going to go, wow, yeah, we haven't got an adventurous woman on television. We'll definitely sign you up. And guess what? 15 years down the line, I have been banging on that fucking door and still there's, you name a famous British adventurous woman on television. Nobody can name one, right? Wow. Except Helen Skelton, who, guess what? She used to be on Blue Peter. <laughs> but even now, she's not doing adventurous stuff. She's, you know, she's doing country bar, which is slightly different and a bit more low-key. You know, so I, I, I've been banging on the adventure presenter door for a long, long time and have been turned away. And, and I'd like to think that it's not just me because I know other women in my, in my field who are doing the exact same thing. And guess what? Nobody's landed it. And I don't know what it is they want. Um, so it's, um, you know, it, I think it, adventure in particular has changed massively for women. Um, you know, there were no Facebook groups when I started out. There were no um, women's adventure weekends away where you get together and talk to other women who had shared the same passions. You know, none of that existed then. And, you know, I was su still super excited to be involved with it and to, you know, hopefully be a role model for those women coming through. Um, and, and it has completely taken off. There are thousands of communities now with thousands of women going to, you know, hundreds of festivals and, and events that are positioned to support women who want to get into adventure. And that is so exciting. Yeah. And maybe one day we'll have the, you know, female bear grills it's probably not going to be me <laughs> it's all right. who knows, right? Mo you know whoever it is it's still moving everything forward in the right direction yeah. yeah it is it is it's just taking a long time and you know it's it, it's the same old thing is that if you if you want to break into it you've almost got to be doing more than the men um and be better than the men and you know everything has to be harder you know, you've got to be up here. Um, and that is inherently, again, unfair. Yep. Yeah. You know what? We're pretty awesome. We are pretty awesome. <laughs> we are pretty O-A-R-S-U-M. <laughs> is that a boat? Where? Is that, has anybody named it that? Oh, awesome. No, I know that should be O-A-R-S-U-M. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I've seen it. I don't know. I have to look and check. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, yeah. That's a pun and a half. That. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's pretty cool. 
Yeah, so I you know I've been, I've been banging the feminist drum for a long time. Yes. Um, and um, um, it's so good to see it's changing. Yeah. So I was going to ask you why you chose to go east to west, but then I realized it was a, one of the first organized races for it. So yes. you didn't actually yeah. choose to go east to west. No, um, I didn't. But also, the, but, well, I sort of, yeah, I suppose I did. Because when I found out that you could go west to east, I was thinking, oh, Barbados, Falmouth. Barbados, Falmouth. <laughs> Let me think. Do I want to race to Falmouth or do I want to race to Barbados? Mm. <laughs> it's, it's, warmer. it's hard it's such a hard decision it's warmer it's safer other people have done it uh, you know, well, let's, let, let's go that way <laughs> awesome yeah. so why did you choose to do it a second time so you were going for a record right is that the reason that you chose to no no and it's never is you know there's a there's a saying that really resonates with me and that is happy people don't climb mountains and um i think that's you know if you get to the core of of it um for many people they are there to prove something to themselves or to other people mm -hmm. um and actually um there's nothing wrong with that having that driving force is can enable you to achieve many great things Yep. And um, certainly the first time I went, it was because I wanted to prove to my to my family and to my mother specifically that I could do it. Um, I didn't have the best relationship with my um, my my mum or my 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 brother and sister, and um, had a really difficult upbringing. And and so I just wanted to bloody well show them that I could do this. You know, that was my driving force. Um, I'd had. Uh, eating disorders in my teens. I suffered dreadfully from anxiety. And so, you know, it was a, a real proving to myself as well that I was capable of doing it. Yep. Um, and, and I came out of that like, oh my God, you know, I can take on the world. I can take on the world. And then, of course, you know, what I was saying about the financial situation and having to move back in my mum and my dad and it taking my mum and I so long. It was so brilliant. But I had this kind of gut, you know, gut feeling that I needed I needed more I needed to be a leader I wanted to take more control over how things had happened and um and and you know yeah like I said be a big fish in, the, in a big pond and, and get that world record you know I'd always been a, a passionate sport player and, and um, but was never any good <laughs> so always enthusiastic but actually just a bit crap <laughs> And this was my chance. My God, I'm going to be brilliant. I'm going to be good and not crap. I mean, that's an awesome situation, right? And then it turned out to be this shit. <laughs> but, you know, um, it's sometimes things don't work out. Life inherently is not fair. And um, I came out of that experience with the, with the women. Um, really quite battered and bruised by it, to be honest. You know, it was really, really hard, emotionally, physically. Um, we were really, really pushing it. You know, my body was just a mess at the end, and emotionally, I was all over the place. And I found it really, really tough to kind of um, learn the lessons from it, to forgive myself, to forgive them, to thank them, and be grateful for their, you know, the, the amazing what they did on the boat as well. You know, it was all very messy. And um, yeah, it took a long time to let it go, but it was only through talking about it that I was able to do, it, to do the lesson go. Because you go and do the talks and people ask you interesting questions, which make you ask those questions of yourself and then you start to realize the life lessons in them. Um, and, and then through that resilience is built. I think, you know, so you need time to sit with it, assess it, discover what it is that, broke you and try fixing it yeah and that takes time it's like um, building a business it is exactly like building it is exactly like you know what ocean rowing is the is the perfect metaphor and the perfect experience to giving you the strength to build a business you know to do anything in life really you know what anybody who who complains and they are right to complain about having sleepless nights with their young child with their newborns 
you should go ocean rowing before you do it because <laughs> then you know what it's like <laughs> and if you can go through you know the uh two hours on two hours off of the bloody brain boat for six months <laughs> you can definitely get through it with a child yeah it's it's, it's a br- it's, it's, it's a brilliant rite of passage you know what if i could if i could invite anybody in their, you know in their 20s to go and do it i would just go bloody do something like this yeah because it sets you up man it really sets you up for the rest of what life will throw at you nothing will be harder a lot really. yeah <laughs> yeah well nothing will be harder than this yeah so you're the first person i've talked to who encountered a shark ah, yeah, no, about was, it yeah i'm happy to share <laughs> it's kind of funny now <laughs> now it it's is now. <laughs> yeah but at the time it was horrible <laughs> So our rudder had been sheared off in bad weather, so it just been ripped off its pinholes. So it fell off and we couldn't fix it. And the weather was so bad that even if we wanted to fix it, we couldn't because we couldn't get into the water. So we had to set up a system of uh, rope and t-shirts and a water bottle off the back of the boat to help stabilize us in the water because what was happening at that time were the waves were so huge and, and the wind so ferocious that people were turning over in the wind um coming down faces of waves so you can either broach which is going sideways or pitch pole which is going end over end and either way they were both shit so they said um we asked the support yacht they said construct this line with t-shirts and the water bottle and that's what we did um, and then we went, ended up going at a bit of a snail's pace and then one afternoon Sue, who was out on the oars, hit something in the water and we discovered it was a shark. <laughs> and the shark was trying to eat the back of the boat. <laughs> and uh, we all got into the cabin because we thought if we, we, hide it, if we hid inside the cabin, if it didn't see us, it wouldn't eat us. <laughs> we all got a bit Logic. irrational. Yeah, it was a bit irrational. <laughs> and, um, and so it's funny because I tell this story and I tell it to young people a lot. And I say, but as skipper, I nominate. <laughs> I nominate to somebody to go, Sue, to go outside and sort it out, right? So, um, you know, this is the thing that you learn about leadership is that you don't have to do everything yourself. You delegated, um, so you didn't. You delegated. It was awesome delegation. Um, but before that, we'd called at the support yacht who'd said, the guy had, the skipper had said, oh, he's just nudging you to say hello. <laughs> We're like, no, he's not. <laughs> We're like this in the water. Ah, you know, the <laughs> back of the boat is right, it's stuck in the water. Oh my God. There's a lot of screaming. Um, anyway, Sue goes out and cuts the lines to the back of the boat and the whole thing has disappeared. <laughs> the whole of the, that rudder system we set up, we got all of it. All of it. And there was a hole in the back of the boat. And anybody who knows how to set up those drogue systems, you know, who do, when you come around to doing the back of your boat and when you kind of um, set up your parachute anchor, you might set it up going off the back of your boat. And if you do, there are metal, they're not cleats, but metal rings that all attach to your metal fixings. And somehow that shark had taken off all, the, the whole system, including all the metal rings. Wow. And so if you can imagine how much strength is needed to literally rip these metal rings, I mean, they are, they're hardcore, right? They need to be because they're supporting so much weight off the, and pressure off the rope systems. Um, I've managed to take the hole off, all of it. Wow. So what'd you do and with the hole in the boat? There's not much we could do, to be honest, because um, we, I went round a, a few days later with Claire and we swam round. <laughs> <laughs> got round to the back and was somebody looking over you're good you're yeah good. No, sue was there sue was there with the knife ah! <laughs> ready to stab so we went round to the back and because of the design of that particular boat the wood rail boat the hull is comp- compartmentalized so the compartment in went into which the hole was just filled with water and that's it it's a small compartment right at the very back yeah. so actually it didn't flood the entire hull if it had we would have been very bottom heavy and splish washy all over the place but it didn't so there was not much we could do and actually it really wasn't worth filling the hole because it, you know it was just like a yeah a yeah. tub of water in it so we sort of had to let it go um and then we ended up using a small drogue a small um, parachute drogue a tiny one throwing it over one side and tacking so rowing in one direction um for a couple of days and then we threw it over the other side and we rode 
a couple of days that way. And so we'd had, we were without a rudder for over a thousand miles and we still crossed the line in 20 years. Well done. Yeah, pretty hardcore, right? <laughs> you know what, though? it's funny, it's funny because um, you, there, there are several ways that people go. They either really, they dig in when things get really bad or they don't. Yep. And um, you don't know how, which way you're going to go. You really don't know in yourself which way you're going to go until it happens. Yep. And I'm pleased to know that when things get really, really bad, I dig in. My sense of humour comes out. Everything's like, let's do this. I'm committed. Let's, you know, solution based. Da, da, da. We can keep going. I'm just, now where this is, you know, I, I got that grip. I, I whinge a lot before that. <laughs> before the really bad stuff, I whinge a lot. <laughs> I know that I'm that person. But when it gets really, really shit, I'm a digger in her. Nice. And, and um, not everybody knows that about themselves because they've not been there. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's, that's something that this, ocean marine experience can give you is insight into how you are when things are really really bad yeah i mean seriously are we going to survive the right type bad and that's and that's something that you know i tried to instill in the crew before we went on the second trip but certainly my mum and i had um on the first one and that is we are on our own if you think that the support yacht is just going to come straight up and, and help you out whenever you call them or some tank is going to pitch up and whisk you away when you're in trouble. You are not prepared. Yep. You need to be entirely self-sufficient. And if you cannot be that, then you shouldn't be out there. One of the biggest questions I get when I say I'm going to do this is people are saying like, oh, are you alone? I'm like, well, we take off at the same time, but we're alone. And yeah. they don't quite get it. And then once you say a support yacht, I think they have that image. And I'm like, yeah. no, it could be like three weeks ahead of me. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the sailing, the, you know, the, the at sea community are exceptionally good at rallying around each other. You know, I mean, it's highly unlikely that you are going to, you know, die. It's highly unlikely that's going to happen. Um, and you know the only the deaths that we've had in the sport have, have been those who have not been clipped on, yep. on board or something's happened to their clip, you know whatever that is, um, and that's a that's a god awful way to go. The, m the more likely thing to happen to you is to be injured, yep. and to be miserable from that injury, and that's hard. But that's you know in lots of ways that's that's really horrible. Yep. And I didn't realise quite how horrible that was until I did the clip around the world and I did the last leg and I broke my thumb on the back end of the Isle of Wight. So we're on the last bit and the Isle of Wight's not that sexy, by the way. <laughs> so, you know, you're kind of coming up to the last straight and then you get wrapped around the winch, you snap your thumb in half and you're bloody useless to everybody. And it's the worst feeling. So did you sail around the world? No, I haven't done that. Um, I sailed from Jamaica to New York, Nova Scotia, across to Ireland, around the bottom of the UK, into um, the Netherlands and then up to Hull. So um, it literally, I'd literally gone across the North Atlantic with, you know, with no problems at all, and then got to the UK. And I could have, after I'd snapped my thumb, <laughs> literally snapped it off, we were going past a place called Dover, which is... Uh, a very well-known port on, in the south of England, and we were so close to it. I actually said to the skipper, Look, "Just let me off. Just let me off the boat. I, 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 I will swim in. I'll swim to Dover if you want me to. I just don't want to be here anymore." Um, having an injury when you're in such a small, confined space with, with your crew is a horrible place to be because they're carrying you. You feel like you're being carried. And there's nothing you can do about it and you you're trying to keep your pecker up and you just can't and it's it's horrible um so you know that's something to be mindful of you know injury prevention pain prevention um because they're the things that are going to throw people over the edge and stop people being kind to each other yep. yeah 
Love your full circle kindness. I know. You know what? My mum was amazing. You know what she did? She, she, she always used to make my, the beds in the, in the cabin for me before I got in at the end of my shift. So I'd get in and, and the cabin was tidy. Her stuff had been put away. The, and my bed was made. You know, she made my, my, she always was the first to offer a cup of tea. You know, do you want something to drink? Would you like something to eat? Something I can do for you. You know, and then I go, Mum, how are you doing? Would you like, you know, and I'd read her a story every night from a, a book of short stories that an other ocean mirror, a lady called Jan Meek had given us. And um, kind of thinking outside of yourself to somebody else. It's hugely beneficial to you, but also to that other person. Yep. And there's nothing worse than the end of a god awful, you know, it's like four o'clock in the morning and you're crawling into bed and all their shit's everywhere. You know, every, you know, the cabin's untidy. You're having to put their crap away, shove it in the side of the bloody, you know, into the nets and stuff. And then you've got to get your sleeping bag out, you know, and it's just, it's demoralizing. I'm it's guessing demoralizing. that happened on the second crossing. <laughs> <laughs> you know what and that is so it's totally okay it's totally okay i try you know you, you you can lead a horse to water yeah um but if you're not all on the same page it's, it's never going to happen and um on, on the trip with the yacht uh, on the clipper my favorite part of being on, on board you're given different roles my favorite one was the mother role um so you know whether you're a man or a woman it doesn't matter it's still the mother watch and it's the one that does the cooking and the cleaning and the reason why i liked it so much is because you felt like you were one doing something mm -hmm. and two supporting the crew enabling them to be able to do what they need to do yeah and um and that makes for a happy ship a happy boat and 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 um people often go into these big expeditions with very selfish reasons and that's okay but doesn't mean they have to be selfish. Yep. Great yeah. message. Mm. Love it. Uh, hard fought. Yeah. Hard fought, and you know, it's, it it just comes from experience. Yeah, and you have a lot of it. This yeah, is I have a lot of experience. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, you, you kind of you come across a lot of egos in these things, and I, you know, I was that person too. You know, I totally get that. I totally get that. But, um. You know, there's a, there's a lot of talk about kindness at the moment, especially with, you know, how things are going on in the world and, and stuff. And, um, you know, it's, it's very undervalued. Um, but makes a huge, makes a huge difference. Does, again, just in general, being nice to people is way undervalued. Like, it's overvalued, but people don't do it. Yeah. And it's something so small and should be so easy. Yeah not enough of it no it's not enough of it um and um you know in in in, in the past in within ocean rowing there's been a lot of unkindness yeah. because it's, it has a, attracted a lot of very egotistical people who are very opinionated and very competitive um and you know i stepped away from ocean rowing and, and that scene for a very long time because of it um, I just didn't want to be around it. You know, I don't want to hear it on forums. I'm not interested in people bitching and being nasty about each other. Yeah. Um, and it's entirely necessary. I really uh, like the uh, women's group. Yeah, good. I'm glad. Yeah, brilliant. Another, another plug for it. I don't know the name of it, though. Women oh, it's called the Awesome Women of Ocean Rowing. Awesome. A O A R S U. No, it's actually spelled A O R S O M E. So, yeah, the Awesome Women of Ocean Rowing. Yeah, because I wanted it to be a safe space where women could ch exchange valuable tips and experiences without it turning into a bitch fest. You created it, right? Yeah. It's, it's awesome. It's amazing. Yeah, and I love the questions really on Fridays. Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly that. And Rachel, Rachel administered it because she's got the time and the passion. And I just, I'm just a bit soft <laughs> at the moment. She just has come up with the most, you know, open, wonderful, you know, interesting questions. And I, and I would love more um, female ocean rowers to be part of it. <clears throat> uh, thanks for letting me comment and post saying, hey, anyone want to come on here? Uh, no, no, of course. No, no, no. We don't have kind of like weird rules. <laughs> The only weird rule we have is be kind, man. Be kind. I'm all in for that one. Yeah. 
Um, I know that you have to get going, get your, your little one. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to chat. I really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, this no has problem. been amazing. And if yes, there's anything well, I can ever do for you, please let me know. Yeah, no worries. Well, when you, when do you go on your trip? When's yours? Uh, I'm planning for Talisker 2022. Okay. So you've got, so I've got time. time. You've got loads of time. Yeah. yeah. Nothing will happen until the year you go. <laughs> Sounds right. I'm just enjoying yeah. chatting with people and it gets me excited again every time I chat with somebody and keeps me going. I don't know. Yeah, fine. well, can you stay in touch because if I can get down to the start of your race, it'd be lovely to see you there. Yeah, you too. Thanks. Uh, also, I did have a question though. I looked for your book. Duh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, this is what happened to the book. So I wrote the book. It was very exciting. It got published. It went on the shelves and then my publisher went burst. Yeah, and he ran away to Australia. Yeah, <laughs> so I have all the books. I have all the books. So okay. Do you want a book? Is that what, you, is that what you're asking? You yeah, like I want a book. <laughs> you can order a book on my. You can order it on my on my what's his name on my on my my website. Oh, cool. Uh, I will. Yeah, sallykettle.com. Yeah, stick it on there. Cool. Is that all right? Yeah. No, it's perfect. Uh, I was just trying to find it, and I was like. It's like $101, like somebody's, what? oh yeah, go on Amazon. Somebody's like oh, trying what? to sell one of them for like 101. I'm like, that's not right. <laughs> well, that's because they're so rare and so yeah. rare. <laughs> so, and I, I just self-published my own book. Uh, Great. So I put that on Amazon and I'm like, how do I get, like some of these books I just can't find. And, but, so I wanted to ask how I can get your book. <laughs> yes. Who else is book are you after? Any books in particular? Uh, I have a whole list of like three or four. Um, I'd have to look up the, the titles. Yeah. If they, if, are they female ocean railways out of interest? Um, I think I've read all the female ones that I could get a hold of. If there's any of you missing, just stick it on, on the, the web, on Facebook. Oh, great idea. And I'll try and source them for you. Okay. Thanks. But especially if they're UK based people. Yes. Most people are UK. That's why I wake up bright and early. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Well, with you know, we started it all off, man. We did it. Yeah, awesome. we are awesome. So thank you so much. Uh, I will definitely be in touch, and I will go buy your book. I will let you know about the other ones, uh, and then just let me know if I can help you. Really well. Follow me on um, Instagram. Follow my uh, charity. Okay, I can do that. Active Pregnancy Foundation. It's on Instagram. All right, so I really hope you enjoyed that episode uh, as much as I did. Uh, I've put some links in the show notes for you for uh, how you can get Sally's book, so on her website, uh, as well as um, the charity that she mentions at the very end. So give those a follow um, and reach out to her if you've got questions, but I'll put those resources in the show notes for you. Uh, I really hope you enjoyed it. And the next episode is going to be another update episode, um, which big things that I'm doing, I've already mentioned it before, but it's actually happening. Uh, so I will give you an update on that coming up. Uh, and yeah, I hope you guys all have an amazing time. Hit that subscribe button if you liked this and you want to hear more. Um, and yeah, 